John, I've been talking to many physicists and cosmologists about the nature of time, uh, comparing time in general relativity versus in quantum mechanics, and the general feeling among most is that time is an emergent quality, is not fundamental, uh, it may be real, but it is derivative of other things. And indeed, some say, uh, a, a, perhaps even a, a growing number, that time is an illusion. Um, how do you look at it first as a physicist? Well, as a physicist, I think um, there is no reason to deny the reality of time. Um, some people think that special relativity, for example, has put that in doubt. Different observers judge simultaneity in different ways. If observer number one thinks that events A and B are the same time, observer number two, that B is before A, number three, A is before B, you say, well, gosh, time must be therefore uh, an illusion in that sense. And the real, uh, real reality is the whole of space and time taken together. I think that's a mistaken argument. It's a mistaken argument because no observer has knowledge of a distant event or the simultaneity of different events until they are unambiguously in that observer's past, in the past light cones, we say in the trade. <laughs> and therefore, that argument can, which is entirely focused on the way observers describe the past, organize their description of the past, cannot establish the reality of the awaiting future. So I don't think the block universe, this total package deal of space and time together, it, it, it is correct. I think we live in a world of unfolding becoming. I think that is perfectly consistent with all that science can tell, tell us about it. Well, certainly the challenge is relativity because in quantum mechanics, time is, at least at, at this level of, of understanding, a, a, um, an absolute quantity. Absolutely, So, yes. so in quantum mechanics, yeah. it, it's dominant. So, you know, that's the argument that, that, that those who are trained in quantum mechanics would favor time, those who are more relativity would, would, would favor time being, being more derived. But although people who try to now build quantum gravity bringing the two together, many are feeling that time has to drop out of those equations. Well, I think we have to be careful. I mean, the problem of quantum gravity is a very severe and difficult problem. There are very interesting ideas. Uh, string theory is one, of course, the most interesting. Highly speculative. It tries to guess how nature behaves on a scale of 16 orders of magnitude. That's to say 10,000 uh, million million times smaller than anything in which we have direct experience. That's a very bold adventure. <laughs> so I think we have to be careful about the uh, quantum gravity. We'll wait and see about that. It's quite possible that, that space and time in some sense emerge from some more, more basic structure. I don't know the answer to that, and nobody, I think, knows the answer to that. If that were true, if, if space and time emerge from something more fundamental, what would that do to the well, fundamental nature of time? I don't think it would remove the <coughs> fundamental nature of time. I mean, after all, matter and energy emerge in the same sort of thing. We don't think that they're illusions. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not made of illusions uh, uh, ourselves. It would be a very interesting scientific development, but I don't think, don't think it denies the reality of time. In trying to understand time, the physics and the cosmology is certainly the dominant scientific approach. I mean, we can talk about the psychology of time. Psychologists do that. Right. But that's perhaps our perceptions and, and doesn't, of course, yes. doesn't no. define no, no. internal no. reality. But another way to look at this would be from a theological point of view, right. particularly from the concept of, of God. And right. if there is a God, how does God experience time, if at all? And there are radically different views on that. Uh, the classic one being that for God to be perfect, God cannot have moved away from the past and, and can't be in a position of anticipating the future. So God has to encompass past, future, present, everything in one big, bold vision, and because to do other than that, God would not be perfect. Uh, I think you have a different view. I do have a different view. That, that, that's, that, that's right. The classical view was that God saw the whole of creation all at once. In other words, actually, in scientific terms, God saw the block universe, the space-time continuum in, in that sense. That was very powerful, and people like Aquinas worked it out. But I don't think that's right. I think we live in a world of true becoming, that is to say that uh, the future is not there already waiting for us. We make it or help to make it as we, as we go along. And if that's correct about the nature of the world, I think it's also obviously theologically correct that God knows things truly. That's to say knows them as they actually are. 
And that means, I think, that God will not only know in an unfolding universe, not only know that events are successive, but will know them according to their natures, which means that God will know them in their succession. If that's the case, then there must be a genuine engagement of God with time. Of course, God is not enthralled to time in the way that we creatures are. We can't escape from time and the unfolding of time. There must be a timeless, eternal, unchanging aspect of God, God's steadfast faithfulness and so on. But I believe that when God brought into being a universe endowed with time, endowed with becoming, God, as an act of divine self-limitation in a way, chose to know that world according to its nature in its becomingness. Therefore, I think that God, even God does not yet know the future. And that's not an imperfection in God. God knows everything that can be known, but the future is not yet there to be known. That would seem to diminish God's providence, the ability and capacity of God to really assure the future of the world in the best possible way. I understand that, uh, that, that remark. I think a very important theological insight, which has been very widespread in the 20th century, is that the act of creation is an act of divine self-limitation on God's part. Nothing, nothing limits God from the outside. But God's nature means that God only does things in accordance with that nature. God brings into being a world in which creatures are given some freedom to be themselves, to make themselves. And I believe God also, that restricts God's power in a way, because God can no longer manipulate everything. Similarly, I believe that God's knowledge is voluntarily restricted by uh, knowing a becoming world in its becomingness. And I think that, does, that seems to me acceptable. That does mean, of course, that, that God is not in total control, but we know that anyway if there is a genuine gift of freedom. I think it is perfectly possible to believe that God will bring about determined ends, but by contingent paths. Hmm. You know, if, if, if creatures don't act this way, God will do something yeah. to steer it in another <laughs> direction. I, I think, that, I think that's a... I obviously, one well, can't work that out in detail, but I have to leave that to God to do that. But, but I think that's, uh, I don't think it diminishes God's providential power in a way that makes him no longer uh, a ground for, for, for sure and certain hope. So integrating the two from a physics point of view and from a theological point of view, what is the nature of time? Well, from the physics point of view, it's an interesting point that you could either, from the physics point of view, believe in the block universe, as in fact, for example, Einstein did, or in a world of becoming that I've been trying to describe. And that tells us that physics by itself, though it constrains how we think about time, does not totally determine how we think about time. There are, if you like, reasons going beyond physics, metaphysical reasons, if you like. They can be theological reasons, indeed which settle whether we go for the block universe or whether we go for an unfolding world. So physics is, doesn't tell us the whole story, even about something so important and embedded within physics as time. From the theological point of view, I think we have this illuminating idea that, that the, act, the act of creation is an act of divine self-limitation, an act of generosity toward, towards creatures. And that helps us to understand some of the, some of the problems of, of, of theology about the strange character of the world and the, the strange and indeed disturbing things that happen in it. 